Νίκο, χειρίζεσαι τον υπολογιστή μου από εδώ τίποτα, όχι έτσι. Όχι, εγώ έχω τον κέρσορ. Screen, right, okay. So. Just, uh, Nikos, give me a green light when we can start. Can we start? Yes, uh, Okay. So, so, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Nikolaos. Uh, greetings and salutations to all attending this open public lecture of the master's program on ecumenical theology of the International Hellenic on behalf of the president of the International Hellenic University and of the Emeritus Professor Mr. Petros Vasiliadis. I was uh, appointed to moderate uh, this afternoon's open lecture of the spring semester of Moet presented by our seminary professor Cyril Hovorun with the title Byzantine Ecumenism. Thus, we are very glad and at the same time honored to have this afternoon with us Professor Cyril, a very distinguished professor in the field of academic theology and also a very prominent ecclesiastical, I may say, figure engaged in many commissions and working groups. Father Cyril has proved to be an expert on the area of ecclesiology, but not only, since he has published a long list of books and articles in several languages, something which is something which simply proves his great talent and the theological knowledge in general. Also, I would dare to call him a citizen of the world. And even though that could be, it would need uh, probably more than half an hour to present his curriculum vitae, uh, though I will shortly present his uh, CV highlighting some important points of his career. So, yes. uh, so our symmetric uh, Cyril Hovorun is a professor in uh, ecclesiology, international relations and ecumenism and Sancti Ignatius College at, in, uh, at Stockholm School of Theology. A graduate uh, of the Theological Academy in Kiev and National University in Athens, and he has accomplished his uh, doctoral studies at the University of Durham under the supervision of Father Andrew Louth. He was a chairman of the Department for External Church Relations of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, first deputy chairman of the Educational Committee of the Russian Orthodox Church, and later a research fellow at the universities of Yale and Columbia. Visiting professor at the University of Münster in Germany, international fellow at Chester Rowning Center for the Study of Religion and Public Life at the University of Alberta in Canada, director of the Huffington Ecumenical Institute at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles and assistant professor at the same university. Additionally, addressing to those who possibly would desire to follow he, this lecture, I would like to say they can do so just by following the YouTube channel of uh, SEMIS. There in chat room, they could also pose their questions uh, for uh, Professor Cyril. And uh, also I count on help of uh, Professor Nicolas Dimitriadis, who will assist us uh, with the grouping and announcing probably the questions of um, in the end, uh, if there is uh, a need, uh, when we shall have uh, time for discussion. So after my such quite, Father Cyril, quite big introduction, I give the virtual floor to you uh, with uh, great uh, expectations, I must uh, admit, and we are all present here for you. So the floor is here for you. Thank you so much, uh, dear Father uh, Augustine Augustinos. Uh, thank you. Uh, many thanks to, to the SEMA Center, uh, to the organizers of, uh, of this um, meeting, uh, to the International Hellenic University, um, well, to Professor Vitsigadis, uh, who is behind this initiative, um, and the greetings to all the listeners and uh, uh, watchers of, of this uh, presentation. So I'm going to talk uh, on uh, an issue which is not usually discussed uh, either in the ecumenical studies or in the 
Byzantine studies. And actually, I, I'll try to merge somehow to marry the two issues, the two subjects or fields, uh, ecumenical studies and Byzantine studies. Um, uh, this is a kind of uh, a new cross section, if you want, of the skill of the fields. Therefore, I uh, I ask your pardon if I miss some something, or uh, I just get confused to confuse you. Uh, so let me try to explore this field of, of Byzantine ecumenism, even though it sounds maybe weird, sounds unusual to some, uh, because we are accustomed to consider ecumenism as a new discipline, and we usually believe. Uh, that ecumenism was born in the beginning of the 20th century. That's why we call the 20th century the century of ecumenism. We are talking about the ecumenical era that started with the famous Edinburgh Conference in 1910 in Edinburgh, which launched the ecumenical movement. And for our, us, the Orthodox, uh, a really a milestone of the ecumenical movement was the famous encyclical letter of the ecumenical patriarchate, which we celebrate this year. Um, uh, and actually, and last year we celebrated uh, its anniversary. Uh, so usually we perceive ecumenism as a modern phenomenon. And when we, we talk about ecumenism, our mind doesn't go, doesn't usually go to, to the pre-modern era, to the Byzantine times. Uh, uh, at the same time, I'm going to argue uh, that uh, ecumenism is a very a pre-modern phenomenon. It's a new thing. It's it's not a new thing. It's actually it's a very traditional thing, and I would argue that uh, ecumenism um, uh, is uh, uh, contemporary. It's uh, it appeared simultaneously with the first ecclesial divisions, with the, when the first ecclesial divisions uh, emerged. Uh, I would argue that it is actually. Uh, core eternal with the church itself. Uh, the moment that the first divisions emerged in the church, that the same moment ecumenism uh, started to be practiced. And I could uh, refer probably as the first reference, it's one of the earliest references, not probably the first one, but one of the earliest references to ecumenism, the words of Apostle Paul, uh, which he addressed to the, uh, to the Christians in Corinth, uh, where he uh, pledged them. Uh, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be, there be no divisions among you, uh, which means that there were divisions among the Corinthians at the time, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Uh, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. <laughs> What I mean is that each one of you say, says, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. So those are actually the earliest denominations, in a sense. Uh, uh, really, uh, Christian groups uh, identified or marked by names whom they followed. Uh, that is the, the kind of the... Uh, etymology of the word denomination, it has to do with the names uh, of, uh, of the first uh, uh, apostles and teachers like Cephas, like Apollos, like Paul himself, and he uh, dis discouraged Christians to, uh, to identify themselves with him himself, him, with, with Paul himself. So that was one of the earliest probably ecumenical message, if you want, in the earliest church, and it was probably not the earliest one, and it was not the last one. Uh, um, I would argue that uh, the church developed its own structures, uh, administrative structures, diocesal structures, dioceses, you know, uh, metropol uh, metropolis, metropolises, archdioceses, and so forth, all those supracriminal structures that we uh, uh, have nowadays. I argue that the church developed those supracriminal superstructures, I would say, exactly to respond to the church divisions, exactly as an ecumenical response to, to the divisions. Because the communities, the earliest communities, they uh, sometimes quarreled with one another. Sometimes they separated and groups of communities separated from other groups of communities, uh, networks of communities, the earliest kind of form of organization of communities separated from other networks of communities. That's why the church started building 
uh, it's uh, uh, kind of superstructure, super communal structures, exactly in order to address uh, to address um, the earliest divisions. That's why, uh, well, things like dioceses, like metropolit uh, metropolises, like patriarchates, we, we can explain those structures as an ecumenical response of the church to the uh, to the extant uh, contemporary divisions in the church. Um, uh, these structures, uh, they uh, emerged in the early church, but it, they were formed, they uh, received their present form in the framework of the Roman Empire. And essentially the uh, administ administrative structures of the church copied or imitated the administrative greed of the Roman Empire. Um, and uh, I would argue also that the Roman Empire provided the earliest kind of consistent systematic framework for ecumenical uh, integrity of the of the church. The Roman Empire, as uh, uh, after it be began kind of embracing Christianity, after it began converting to Christianity, also provided the church with the earliest structures, ecumenical structures, the first mechanisms of securing the integrity of the church against the divisions. Uh, and uh, uh, it started as early as actually as the Roman Empire began moving towards uh, the church and the rapprochement between the church and the state uh, uh, began. Uh, as early as one year after the famous Milano, uh, Milan Edict, which as we know uh, was signed by uh, Constantine and Licinius and that legalized uh, Christianity. One year after that, Constantine, who was still the emperor of the West, he was not yet the uh, uh, sole uh, ruler of the Roman Empire, he uh, took care of the church divisions of the time. The most um, painful division at the time was the so-called Donatist schism in Northern Africa, in the Latin-speaking North, Northern Africa, and a similar schism, uh, the Militian uh, schism existed also in the Greek-speaking Africa in Egypt. Uh, so Constantine took care of the Donati schism and he uh, convened the council in Arles, uh, what is now France, in uh, 314. This was the first uh, council, uh, imperial council, convened by the imperial authorities. And it kind of preceded the famous, the more, the more famous imperial council, the Council of Nicaea in 325. Uh, and um, I would argue that this was the first ecumenical council as well, not just the first imperial council, but also the first ecumenical council in the modern sense of the word, because the purpose of Constantine was exactly to address the schism, the Donatist schism at that council. Uh, he first tried to engage the church to kind of uh, commission the task of reunification of the church to the church itself, uh, primarily to the church of Rome, to the bishop of Rome at that time, um, uh, it was uh, Bishop Miltiadis, uh, the bishop of Rome. Uh, so Constantine essentially outsourced this task, ecumenical task to the church of Rome and, and the church of Rome failed to, uh, to meet uh, the expectation of Constantine. Miltiadis couldn't kill the schism. And we know that this schism lasted for a long time. It was really, difficult to, uh, to tackle it. Nevertheless, so Const after Constantine uh, saw that the Church of Rome failed to address the Donatist schism, he took the initiative in his own hands, as it were, and he convened this Council of Arles uh, as an ecumenical initiative of the imperial scale. Uh, uh, the Council of Nicaea uh, later on in 3, uh, 325 somehow followed the same paradigm of the Council of Arles of uh, 314. Uh, it also dealt with a local schism in Alexandria this time, not in, uh, in uh, Libya, in, in Latin speaking Africa, where the Donatist schism flourished, uh, became spread, but in, Greek, in the Greek speaking Africa, in Egypt. And as we know, uh, the, the first, the schism, the kind of um, tension there emerged between the Bishop of Alexandria, Alexander, and his presbyter, Arius. Uh, who was also supported by some other presbyters. He was not alone. He was not, not, he was not a lonely wolf, as it were. He had a support of other presbyters and some bishops from Libya, from the neighbor, neighbor uh, country, a kind of place territory. And this was a kind of local schism, uh, in, to some extent similar to Donatism. And Constantine tried to deal with this local schism again. 
for this purpose, he convened the council in Nicaea exactly to heal the schism. Uh, and um, uh, in this sense, we can, we can say that the Council of Nicaea was also ecumenical. Uh, now, it, it was ecumenical in two senses. Ecumenical in the sense that the bishops from, from the entire ecumeni, ecumene, the entire kind of Roman Empire, uh, were invited to that council. And in the second sense, in the modern sense, it was ecumenical with the purpose to heal uh, the divide, to bridge the divide, and to, to put together different part, uh, parties uh, arguing with one another uh, in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, uh, that's why I would I would argue that the Council of Nicaea was also ecumenical in its in its purpose in its uh, in its intention. Uh, together, of course, with the intention to establish the orthodoxy, the right orthodox formulations of faith regarding the Holy Trinity. Uh, however, um, this Council of Nicaea did not bring uh, the desired unity to the Church. Uh, there, this unity kind of spread. Uh, further to the rest of the empire uh, as a kind of follow-up of that council because not everyone in the church, most of bishops in the church really did not get the meaning of the terms like homoousios, like, you know, the, the language which was elaborated by the council of Nicaea and uh, the church continued to be divided. Um, and the uh, <clears throat> Constantine himself and later on, uh, his followers, like his son Constantius II, uh, tried to address the same problem of, of the divisions within the church by uh, promoting different ecumenical kind of projects, undertakings. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes Constantius II is accused of being Arian because indeed he supported the Arian party or the party of Eusebians uh, consisting of uh, people like Eusebius of Caesarea, Eusebius of Nicomedia, who promoted the cause of, of Arius somehow. Uh, I, I think uh, the modern scholarship uh, uh, comes to a conclusion that, well, it's, it's a, a rather a misjudgment about Constantius II. He was not really a pro-Aryan. He didn't know much about theology. What he cared more uh, was the unity, integrity of the church. He, he, ju he was just trying you know, to bridge the gap within the church and to, to bring the pieces of the church together. But because he was not theologically educated, he just made a wrong cal calculation whom to... Uh, uh, to engage, uh, whom to rely upon in this ecumenical undertaking. And he, uh, he chose to rely on the Arianist party. I'm not going to argue now whether it is a right or wrong uh, name for, for this party, but let us say Arian or Eusebian party or non nicene party, is probably it's a better word. <clears throat> so he chose to rely on that party in order to bring you know, the church together. He didn't rely on the pro nicene party very much because he saw Athanasius the Great, who was the protagonist of this party, as a troublemaker, as a divider in the church. And he actually hated Athanasius, not because he did not share the beliefs of Athanasius, but because, well, probably he didn't understand Athanasius, but because he saw Athanasius as a person who, you know, who uh, 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 divides the church. And uh, for this reason, he was kind of seen for a long time as a, a, an Aryan emperor. I argue he, is, he was not. He was just a, a, an ecumenist who chose a, a wrong uh, strategy for his ecumenism. Uh, and in, exactly in the spirit of, uh, of ecumenical kind of uh, rapprochement, he uh, convened an, a series of uh, councils, which perceived, he perceived also as ecumenical, also in both sense. Ecumenical, ecumenical in the sense of pan-imperial, uh, inviting people from you know from the entire empire, and uh, also uh, ecumenical in the modern sense as bridging you know the divided parts of the church. In this spirit, exactly of ecumenism, he convened the such councils as the Council of Antioch in 341, the Council of uh, Serdica, which were actually two councils in 343, then the Council in Nike in Thrace. He chose the place to sound like Nicaea, uh, but it was a different city in uh, Nick in, in Thrace uh, in 359. Uh, and again, in the same year, the councils in Selevkia, in Cilicia and uh, in Armenia, modern Rimini in, in, in Italy. So all those councils were uh, convened with the idea that they are ecumenical, that they would kind of replace the council of Nicaea in the sense of bridging, you know, bringing the entire church together and bridging the gaps between different groups within the church. Um, 
yes, unfortunately, this ecumenical project of Constantius II failed. Uh, failed, uh, why did it fail? Uh, Constantius uh, chose, well, following the advices of his theological advisors at the time, he chose a wrong strategy for his ecumenical um, uh, undertaking. He chose not to discuss controversial terms, like the most controversial term, term in the original um, uh, Nicene Creed was the term usia, that the, the son is uh, born, is begotten from the essence of the father. Let me quote exactly how the Nicene, the original Nicene uh, uh, Creed uh, stated it. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God, begotten, genithenda, from the father, only begot, begotten, monogeny, that is from the essence of the father, ectisusias to patros. So that is the last phrase, ectisusias to patros, became really controversial. And that's for this reason, uh, uh, a number of bishops, I would say the majority of the bishops, rejected Nicaea after, after, after the Nicaea. And uh, Constantius II preferred to drop altogether the entire terminology connected with the word usia. That was his e ecumenical approach. Let us not talk usia at all. Let us uh, use a very neutral phrase, homios, that the, the son is homios, is like the father. And uh, this uh, was, this term was too vague, uh, was too controversial, and it opened the door to, uh, an interpretation, to the interpretation of the Trinity, which we call heterousion, uh, the Eunomian and uh, Aetian uh, interpretation, which stated that the son is unlike the father. Uh, so this ecumenical formula of the, promoted by Constantius II actually opened the door to a very heretical formula of the heterousian formula. Uh, that's why the ecumenical project of Constantius II failed. However, this ecumenical project was revitalized again by Theodosius I, who, as we know, convened the Second Ecumenical Council in Constantinople, uh, and uh, he uh, chose a different strategy. He relied now not on the non-Nicaeans, but on the Nicaeans, whom we call neo-Nicaeans, including the Cappadocians. And he uh, decided to reintroduce the Nicaean formula as the basis of his ecumenical project. But, and that is my kind of point that I want to make, he did not just replicate the old Nicene formula, he amended it. And the Council of Constantinople, what it did, it dropped this controversial part, actus usias to patros, from the creed, exactly to meet the sensitivities, ecumenical sensitivities of the church of the time. That's why I, I would argue that the Council of, Nice of, of Constantinople that uh, kind of perfected the, uh, the creed of Nicaea uh, followed the ecumenical mindset, the rationale, the idea behind this, uh, this amended creed was exactly to be ecumenical, to drop the controversial formulas in order to, you know, to reach out to, the, to those groups in the church who could not digest you know, this difficult formula. Uh, that's why my argument is that the, the Council of Constantinople, uh, the Second Ecumenical Council, was ecumenical par excellence. It really, uh, in, well, made some additions to the Council of Nicaea in the ecumenical spirit. Um, um, so, the creed that we use nowadays, the so-called Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, is actually ecumenical. It's an ecumenical creed. It reflects the ecumenical sensitivities and concerns of the uh, of the fourth century. And by by professing this creed, we we effectively profess a sort of Byzantine, early Byzantine ecumenism, if you want. That 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 would be my conclusion from this story. Another story happened uh, with, uh, uh, with the outburst of another controversy, the, what we call the Christological controversy, controversy in, the, uh, in the fifth century. Um, uh, this controversy was really incited, I would say, uh, triggered by uh, the Council of Ephesus, but not the first one, not in 431, but the second Council of Ephesus, the so-called Robert Council, uh, which took place uh, in Ephesus in 449. 
uh, that council was not ecumenical. That council uh, stood for only one part in the church, for the Alexandrian part, which was led by Dioscorus, the Archbishop of Alexandria at the time. Uh, Dioscorus was not ecumenically minded, unfortunately. I know that he's respected by our Oriental brothers, uh, but I think we should agree, uh, us, I'm, I mean, the Byzantines and the Orientals, that Dioscorus could be kind of a brilliant mind, but he was not ecumenical. He insisted on his own language, on the Alexandrian language for theology, and he, he really cared to promote the cause of Alexandria. And that's why this, uh, that was one of the reasons why this uh, robber council, the, the second council of Ephesus failed. And uh, it had to be amended uh, soon by uh, another council, which was convened two years later by, uh, the, by the Empress uh, Pulcheria and Emperor Mar uh, Marcianos, uh, Martian, uh, at the Council of, um, the council of in, in Chalcedon in 4, uh, 451. <clears throat> One of the reasons why that council was convened, I believe, was ecumenical again, because the Council of Ephesus II, uh, the robber council, um, uh, created a a, 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 a kind of a chasm, uh, a divide between the Church of the East and the Church of the West. Uh, the Church of Rome was really alienated by, by Ephesus too and by the policies of uh, the imperial policies that supported had supported uh, Ephesus too. Uh, and again, the imperial um, authorities following the line of Constantine in you know, caring to breach the divided parts of the churches of, of the church um, uh, convened this council of Chalcedon exactly to bridge the gap with the church of Rome, with the West. That's why I believe that one of the rationales of the council of Chalcedon was exactly to, uh, to bridge this gap. We can see it even from the definition of Chalcedon. The original <clears throat> draft of the definition of Chalcedon, as we know about it, because this council was very well documented, uh, uh, followed exactly the language of Cyril of Alexandria. But uh, at the latest stage, this uh, definition was redrafted and uh, 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 the Western elements, Christological elements uh, taken from the language of Pope Leo of Rome were inserted to, uh, to the definition. That's why we have this formula of, of, of the Chalcedon that, that, that we believe in uh, uh, one Christ in two natures. That was a language uh, borrowed from, from the language of Leo. That's why the Council of Chalcedon really tried to put together ecumenically Two languages, the Western language and the language of Cyril, which dominated the East. Um, uh, in, in a sense, the Council of Chalcedon was very similar to the Council of, uh, of Nicaea. It tried to, uh, to uh, uh, stitch together uh, the pieces of the church that had been divided or alienated from each other. And like Nicaea, it did, it did not reach its, its goal of, uh, of putting the church together again. It caused further divides. And unfortunately, following the Chalcedon, the Council of, of Chalcedon, the church became further divided. And as we know, um, it, um, it led to the separation of the two patriarchates against other three patriarchates. The patriarchate of Alexandria and Antioch in their majority did not accept the Council of Chalcedon and uh, stood against the Patriarchate of Rome and Constantinople, joined by the Patriarchates at the small uh, Church of Jerusalem, uh, which had supported the Council of, uh, of, of Chalcedon. Uh, that's what we call the, what I call the Great Schism Number One, uh, how it occurred, and it was the largest schism which lasts until our days. Um, its scale was larger than even the Great Schism Two between the uh, Church of Rome and Constantinople in the 11th century. Um, and this schism uh, really became a problem for the church and for the empire. Uh, for the first time uh, on a large scale, a schismatic group, a group that separated from the rest from the imperial church started, uh, started creating its own hierarchy systematically, the, what we now call the oriental churches. And this also became a huge problem, political problem for the empire because uh, uh, those churches that did not accept the Council of Chalcedon, they were located on the frontiers of the empire in, the, in Syria, in the east, and in Egypt. And those frontiers were particularly vulnerable to the invaders, to the Persian invasions, 
first and then to the Arab invasions. Um, and uh, um, often uh, people from uh, the, what we now call Oriental churches at the time, they were not really like that. They collaborated with the invaders. So they, they preferred you know, the foreign rule to the Roman rule. And this was a major problem for the Byzantine empire uh, to have collaborators collaborating with the enemies uh, on the basis of uh, Christological formulas. That, that's why all the emperors after the Chalcedon cared to bridge you know, the gap, the widening gap between the Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian churches. Without any exclusion, every single emperor, every single imperial authority had its prime, uh, kind of prime goal to heal the, uh, the gap between the Byzantine and Oriental uh, churches, the Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian church, anti-Chalcedonian churches. This became, this underpinned this kind of task uh, urge uh, to keep the empire together underpinned all the following, all the um, uh, uh, following ecumenical projects uh, in the aftermath of the Chalcedon. Uh, there were some unsuccessful ecumenical projects and there were some more successful ecumenical projects. I would call as an unsuccessful ecumenical project the one promoted by Emperor Zeno. Uh, who is known by his <clears throat> document, which was promoted in, promulgated in 482, which is known as uh, Henoticon. It was a document, an imperial document, a decree <clears throat> that uh, prohibited ethical discussion, which would involve the term nature, thesis. Uh, in a sense, it was similar to the, um, to the project, uh, to the idea, uh, prohibited any theological discussion on the basis of the term usia in the fourth century, in the middle of the fourth century. Um, uh, and as we see, censoring theological discussions did not work. It could not bring the church together. That's why the ecumenical project of Constantius II and of Zeno failed eventually. It did not bring the church together. Only a sincere and open theological discussion on very sensitive matters, sensitive issues could work. That is also the idea of, of, of a true ecumenism. In ecumenism, we cannot you know, keep silence on issues. We could not avoid issues. We should discuss issues. Only this way we can uh, get closer to each other. We can really achieve an ecumenical goal. Uh, that's why any ecumenical dialogue, even in our days, that avoids difficult questions is destined to fail. Just as any ecumenical dialogue in the fourth or fifth century failed because of the uh, because of uh, um, silencing the discussions, like what Constantius did or what Zeno did uh, with his Enoticon. Uh, instead of uh, silencing, silencing and censoring theological discussions, Justinian, another great uh, Byzantine emperor, um, uh, applied a different uh, strategy. Uh, first of all, he established the first recorded, at least, proper ecumenical dialogue. He brought different parties to Constantinople, to his palace. He invited Severus of Antioch, who was the leader of the anti-Chalcedonian party, uh, to engage in the discussion with the court theologians, including people like uh, Leontius of Byzantium, who represented the Chalcedonian party. And essentially Justinian put those two parties together to a dialogue. It was the proper kind of the first ecumenical bilateral dialogue in the, you know, in the Christian history. Uh, uh, and we could say that uh, uh, the ecumenical dialogues were as a genre of the ecumenical rapprochement were invited by Justinian. They are essentially Justinianian dialogues. Uh, and uh, he uh, undertook something else, Justinian. He also uh, tried to construct new theological formulas, new theological languages, uh, so to say, lingua ecumenica of that time. And uh, we call nowadays that language neo Chalcedonian. Uh, modern scholarship. Uh, kind of has this term neo-Chalcedonianism to denote the undertaking of Justinian. And essentially, I'm going to argue that the neo-Chalcedonian project of Justinian was par excellence ecumenical. It was the ecumenical project of Justinian, the entire neo-Chalcedonian uh, theology and Christology. Uh, the uh, method of this uh, neo-Chalcedonian ecumenism uh, under Justinian was to uh, reconnect the language of Chalcedon with the language, language of Cyril of Alexandria. 
uh, to make this language more inclusive, to include both languages. And that's why <clears throat> the language of, uh, um, of Justinian, uh, of the neoclassidonian theology, which was also um, uh, a, a lot of prominent great theologians of that time, of the fifth century and the sixth century, you know, the sixth century contributed to, the, to this language. People like uh, Leontis of Byzantium and, uh, and others, they, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, helped, uh, contributed to, even though Leontius of Byzantium was not neoclassidonian himself, but he certainly contributed to, uh, to this Justinian, pro Justinian project. Uh, it in, this language included both terms, one nature and two natures. It stated that it's okay, essentially, to speak about one nature or two natures in Christ, uh, contingent on how we understand those, uh, those phrases. Um, and, um, this uh, neo-Chalcedonian project, Justinianian Ecumenism, was uh, confirmed by the Fifth Ecumenical Council. Uh, this was another major ecumenical council in the double sense of the, of the word ecumenical. It was uh, pan-imperial on the one hand, and it was also uh, uh, aiming at uh, the uh, reunification of the church. Its main purpose was exactly to reunite the divided church. Um, I would call the Fifth Ecumenical Council is the most ecumenical council uh, in the among other ecumenical councils. Uh, it's a general ecumenical, and it really its purpose was to to stitch together the uh, parts of the church which had fallen. Then uh, uh, this Justinianian Neo-Chalcedonianism was not that much. Kind of successful in its later iterations. There were other kind of attempts to build a, a, a ecumenical projects on the basis of this uh, neo-Chalcedonian ecumenism, like for instance the one which was promoted by uh, the Emperor Heraclius in the beginning of the seventh century. I call it the Heraclian neo-Chalcedonianism. Uh, he, uh, Heraclius followed the same line. He wanted to use the language of activity uh, which had been employed by Justinian uh, to bridge the, uh, the divided parts of, of the empire. Uh, actually, his ambition and the, the ambition of the theologians who supported him, including people like Patriarch Sergius of Constantinople, uh, was to create a language which would uh, be an umbrella for all the divided groups. Like, for instance, including not just uh, Anti-Chalcedonians, uh, Anti-Chalcedonians, but also to include Nestorians. That's why they eventually employed the language of one will in Christ. Uh, even the Nestorians believed in one will in Christ. Not to say about the non-Chalcedonians and the Byzantines. Even Rome subscribed to uh, to this ecumenical project of Heraclius when Pope Honorius endorsed the uh, the initiative of Heraclius, and uh, uh, that was a kind of a success, in a sense, of this ecumenical project of what we call now monoenergism and monothelitism. At the same time, some theologians, some profound theologians like Maximus the Confessor, before him Sophronius of Jerusalem, saw a danger in this project. And being ne neo-Chalcedonians themselves, like Maximus, Maximus was a ne neo-Chalcedonian theologian, but he saw a kind of a mistake in the, in the direction that the original Justinianian Neo-Chalcedonianism Neo had taken in the hands of Heraclius and his collaborators. So Maximus suggested a correction to Neo-Chalcedonianism of Heraclius, and he promoted his own Neo-Chalcedonianism. He also promoted his own version of ecumenism. Maximus was not a, an anti-Neo-Chalcedonian. He was a Neo-Chalcedonian. And Maximus was not an anti-ecumenist. He was an ecumenist, but with a kind of corrected version of ecumenism. Maximus was very, very much, I believe, uh, an ecumenical figure. I believe that he was really one of the greatest ecumenists of that time because he really tried to bridge the East and the West. We know how, how long he spent, how much time he spent in the West, in Carthage, in Rome. He uh, secured support of, of the popes of Rome for the cause of, of deothelitism that he promoted. And he even convened the Council of Lateran in 469, a very important council, uh, which was a very ecumenical event as well, bridging the East and the West. And that's why I believe that Maximus was really a Neo-Chalcedonian and really an ecumenist. And his, neo, uh, the, his kind of corrected version or the version 
of corrected neo-Chalcedonianism and his version of ecumenism was endorsed later on by the council in 680-681, which we now know as the Sixth Ecumenical Council of Constantinople. Uh, that was an ecumenical council in both senses, that it provided, it reconciled the East with the West, importantly, because it adopted the decisions of the Council of uh, Lateran in, of, of uh, 649, later on the Western Council, and it reconciled the Church of the East with the Church of the West. Uh, I know that I don't have a lot of time. Let me just skim a bit and uh, um, uh, I will come to my last, probably last point. So, so far we see uh, the strategy of the Byzantine emperors, ecumenical strat strategies to keep uh, to preserve the integrity of the church for the sake of the integrity of the empire. They endorsed dialogues, they endorsed, they supported and financed the ecumenical councils. We, we should not forget that the ecumenical councils were extremely expensive. Uh, they, they costed fortunes and only the empire could afford to, you know, to support the ecumenical councils. So the empire supported the ecumenical council exactly for the ecumenical purposes, because the empire believed, the emperors believed that the ecumenical councils would keep the church together, the preserve the integrity of the church. When the Byzantine Empire became weaker, uh, the West became West took initiative, ecumenical initiatives, uh, initiatives in its hands. This time, however, not the Western empires like the Carolingian Empire, but the Church of Rome, uh, which was okay because the Church of Rome always in the first millennium supported the initiatives of the Byzantine emperors to, you know, to preserve the unity of the church. It was very ecumenical and very kind of uh, disposed to, you know, to preserve orthodoxy. However, uh, 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 as the millennium changed, uh, and in the in the in the wake of the Carolingian of the Gregorian reforms, the ecclesiology, the ecclesial mentality of the Church of Rome changed, and uh, the Church of Rome began uh, perceiving itself as the universal church, identifying itself with the universal church and uh, 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 well promoted insistently uh, its own idea about the primacy of the Roman church. And essentially the idea of ecumenism changed as well. Uh, uh, in, in Byzantium, ecumenism meant the preservation of the fellowship of the churches within the empire. The churches had to stay together in unity and communion with one another without submitting themselves to another church, like to the church of Constantinople, for instance. But Rome adopted uh, then a different mentality that you have to submit to us in order to to be to, con to constitute one church. And ecumenism started to mean a submission to Rome. Unfortunately, this, this is a medieval kind of model of, of ecumenism, which was also implemented in councils, like in Byzantium. Byzantium expressed its ecumenism in ecumenical councils. So the Roman church also continued to express its ecumenical vision in councils, but this time those councils were what we call union councils. They required that the church of Constantinople would submit itself to the Church of Rome. In this period, the councils of Lyon, for instance, in uh, 1274 um, uh, was convened in the same uh, spirit, the Council, council of Ferrara Florence in, um, in the middle of the 15th century gathered the Council of Brest in uh, 1596. Those union councils uh, also promoted ecumenism, but this was kind of a different ecumenism, I would argue, than the Byzantine ecumenism. It was rather an ecumenism of submission rather than the ecumenism of, you know, fellowship, uh, as it was in, in Byzantium. And exactly, I believe, and this, this kind of medieval ecumenism, fortunately, was condemned even by the Roman Church. Uh, in, the, in the spirit of Vatican II. Uh, the, we, we should not identify more than kind of Roman ecumenism with the medieval ecumenism of, of, uh, of the councils of Brest or Lyon or Ferrara Florence. Uh, like for instance, the famous uh, joint declaration uh, uh, which was adopted by the Orthodox and the Catholic Church in Balamant in 1993 condemned unionism as a method of, of ecumenism, which was a very significant, I believe, declaration. And it meant that the church, modern Church of Rome, distanced itself from the medieval kind of uh, model of ecumenism. Uh, however, uh, modern kind of Orthodox anti ecumenists, because yes, we know that. Uh, fundamentalist uh, circles and very conservative circles, they are against ecumenism. They uh, sometimes identify ecumenism with the medieval kind of Roman uh, methods of ecumenical uh, movement of e ecumenism. And I, well, I would agree with them that those methods are wrong. 
However, ecumenism did not start with the Roman ecumenism. Ecumenism started with the early church and the most kind of important for us models of ecumenism were promoted by Byzantium. They are encoded in our creed. They are encoded in the way how we perceive the incarnation. As far as we uh, subscribe to the council of uh, the fifth ecumenical council, for instance, we subscribe to ecumenism, to the Byzantine ecumenism. That's why when we reject ecumenism in wholesale altogether, we essentially reject our own tradition. We reject our creed, we reject you know, the councils, the ecumenical councils of the church, we reject ourselves. And the people, when they reject ecumenism altogether in wholesale, they essentially you know, assault uh, the, the tradition they, they pretend to, to protect. That is the para paradox of anti-ecumenism, orthodox anti-ecumenism. By protecting the tradition, they essentially reject it because they uh, throw away uh, a very important part of our tradition, which was expressed in the ecumenical councils. Well, that's uh, kind of my uh, uh, take on this. This is my conclusion that I'd like to make that uh, it's an, just another paradox of you know, anti-ecumenism and fundamentalism. It's very much anti-traditional. It uh, uh, damages the tradition it pretends to, to protect. And people who are anti-ecumenical, they just, they're just ignorant. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know their own history. They don't know their own you know, theology. That is the problem. Uh, that's why I believe that to be orthodox is to be uh, disposed ecumenically, to be uh, to seeking to seek uh, the ecumenical unity, the unity of the church. All right. Uh, so after uh, this presentation, I wonder what I could say. We truly thank you very much, Father Cyril. You were um, a, flow, a, a river, huh? a river. You were a river without a stop. I have kept... Uh, I think five pages of notices, <laughs> but uh, if I may, I, I have to give you um, a credit because it's very difficult actually to describe in, uh, in 50 minutes uh, a history of centuries, and I think you did it well. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it was very informative, productive, and very ecumenical, uh, your presentation, Father Cyril. Um, before going to the questions that we have, some of them uh, I see here, I'd like to, if I may say a few things about your presentation, also for those who probably were not from the beginning of your presentation. So just I kept uh, a few notes, uh, starting from the Constantine the first. Huh? Uh, so uh, if uh, I'm not wrong, I do remember that also another name that he had, uh, the Emperor Constantine, was uh, the title of being a Pacificus. Yeah. The Emperor of Pacificus. So he was responsible in order to keep the internal, let's say, peace within his, the, the boundaries of the empire. Um, so in order to, to, to be able to, to keep up with his uh, foreign policy and with economics and with uh, the alliances uh, that he would probably would like to, to develop. So he was not um, in favor of, of um, spending resources and time in theological quarrels and uh, controversies. So he was in favor of unification or of uh, unity between the different parties, because after all, he was the emperor of all citizens of Constantinople, not only of Christians, but all, all, but of, um, all of them. So um, another that I would like also to, to, to refer, and um, I kept it as a high highlight from your presentation, Father Cyril, was the, um, the personal relation between the Constantius II with uh, the, the Father of Nasu. Yeah. It was something that you mentioned. And uh, so uh, I'd like to pose a question, if I may, that the personal relations through the, 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 the development of the um, history of the church, we could say that influenced 
in one or another way, in a negative or a positive way, the, 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 the process and the development of the internal ecclesiastical relations between the local churches. So the ecclesiastical figures um, had a great deal of influence on the general, um, let's say, historical process, right? Is it, uh, I'd like to have a comment on that. Well, there was a bad, bad chemistry between uh, Constantius and Athanasius, that's, that's for sure. And Athanasius mm -hmm. was not an, an easy person, after all. <laughs> he was a fighter. So, yeah, but in a sense, I feel that this is not fair to history. I mean, why, if two leaders cannot cope together, why they're not good, uh, uh, as you said, chemistry didn't work out, why this should go in a way of consequence huh? to the simple people who just well, that's, that's, to, that's to that's leave there? Cool. That's very true, yeah, that's, that's very true. And well, fortunately, I would say, uh, the, the, the theology of Athanasius eventually prevailed. It was justified by, by Theodosius, right? And we know that Athanasius won, but he had very small chances to win because the majority of the church, well, some people say that up to 80% of the church were Arians. Well, they were, they were not Nicaeans and Athanasius was a very marginal figure. And he was actually, for, for some period of time, he had, of course, the uh, powerful allies in the West. But sometimes even in the West, people stopped kind of supporting him. Even Osius of Cordoba, we know that he stopped, he betrayed Athanasius. And for some, uh, at some time, uh, for some period of time, he was alone, Athanasius, in the entire empire who supported the Council of Nicaea. Well, it, it was providential that eventually his theology prevailed, but... Yeah, it, uh, it's a miracle, and that's why we celebrate him so much. Uh, and fortunately, the church was not divided as deeply, as profoundly as it became divided in the fifth century, because we have another conflict, like the conflict between Dioscorus and the empire of the time, and it led to, to, the, to, to the schism, which lasts until our days. And it yes. was also, to a great extent, a personal schism. It was a schism of personalities. Yes. Also, another uh, point that I would like to refer to is that you mentioned quite a few times the problem of the, the lack, if we may so, or the incapability of the language most of the times to, 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 to be, um, to, to fail to describe actually the sacrament, the mystery of the relation between humanity and divinity, because uh, in the end of, of, of the day, this is uh, the task, let's, let's say, of the religions to describe uh, uh, in human terms, this relation between divinity and humanity. So when language fails to do so, we have these schisms appeared in, in, in history. And so we, we, we saw through your presentation, Father Cyril, these um, efforts coming from the, the emperor and from the uh, state, uh, how to, to gap and how to, 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 to bring together again uh, the, the, the dividing, uh, the separating parties. So we have a comment and at the same time a question coming from uh, Stato Costa, uh, where she says, uh, uh, if you are uh, considering that ecumenical being an ecumenical, it means at the same time, it, it, it is the, the one who desires also the, the convergence, the, 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 um, excuse me, the, la convergence, right? the, the convergence to, to come together. So being ecumenical means to, to bring together is the one who desires unity, yeah. right? So it's a comment and a question at the same time. Yeah, I think I well, that's a, that's exactly the point. Ecumenical meaning someone who uh, desires and who um, acts in order to achieve a unity uh, of the parts uh, or, or that have been had been divided, uh, the parts of the church. So first there is a schism, there is a divide in the church, and then the ecumenical efforts try to bring those parts together. That is the general uh, definition of ecumenism. It's the different, I call it defragmentation of Christianity. 
Mm -hmm. Also, if I remember well, in the beginning of your presentation said about this uh, uh, approach and this um, uh, very famous teaching of Apostle Paul about uh, how to keep uh, the internal unity uh, within the church. And uh, it came to my mind, the, the prayer of Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, where we have this uh, John uh, 17, 11, right? Where he, he, he prays to his father to keep uh, through your name those whom you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. So probably since that time, we have this um, anguish uh, of the Lord to, to preserve the, the unity uh, and the integrity of his own uh, body, if we may say so. Exactly. So it's even... It goes even back than the period of Apostle Paul. Also, uh, that's why I said the medical character, one of the earliest, of... but was not the first one, certainly. Yeah, yeah. And I also I'd like to uh, underline in this regard that we probably mm -hmm. need to distinguish between oneness and unity of the church. We often confuse those two uh, categories, but they are not the same. We believe in one church, and the church is one, mm -hmm. right? But it is not the same as unity of Christians because. Christians were always divided, and they always try to get together to restore their unity, uh, being, uh, well, uh, to belong to the, to the one church. That's why uh, it, when we confuse oneness and unity of the church, we uh, end up being anti-ecumenical, because we, we say, well, we are in the church, we don't care about others, because we believe in one church, and... It's up to others whether they want to be with us or they don't want to be with us. But that, that is the problem that uh, this kind of anti ecumenical attitude stands from the confusion between unity and oneness. Yes, the church was always one and it was always divided. And that's why it was always ecumenical because uh, Christians, I mean, bishops, emperors, whoever, they try to bring back uh, uh, the unity uh, of the church, or in, in other ways, to actualize the oneness of the church into, into the church's unity. Yes, correctly. So um, the, also, we could say that we are all in the same boat, right? So, and since God is one, his body is one. Exactly. In the same way, his church is one. Yeah. And also, you, you mentioned rightly that... Um, it's not a unity, it's not uniformity. So we have to talk about unity in, uh, in diversity. Why not? Why not? Because diversity, it, it's a sign of richness. And it, it's always linked with the cultural development, which is localized in, in, in certain areas and also in certain time, in certain time. So um, that's why we say that worship is something alive. Exactly. And at the same time, the ecumenical movement has proved that Christ is not an object, that we have to keep it just for ourselves, as you said, but we have to, 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 to share it with others. So, uh, yes, I, I, I keep what you said, that the, the, the separation was going actually hand by hand with unity, but just sometimes it was unity, the winner, or separation, the... the the winner of that relation. Uh, and uh, exactly. yes, yes, please. Just to follow up uh, what you've said, that uh, exactly the disunity in the church occurs when uh, uh, the church's unity or oneness is confused with uniformity. When, yes. when people try to translate the idea of unity or oneness of the church into uniformity, this leads to divisions. That was, I believe, that was one of the reasons why our Oriental brothers and sisters separated from us because the uniformity was imposed upon them to a great extent mm -hmm. in the fifth, fifth century. And this caused a reaction to, uh, to this imposition of un uniformity. It was one of the reasons, not the only one, but it was one of the reasons. That's why it is important to preserve diversity within unity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think it's also linked with the, the, the fact that because of that, what you said, it's linked also with the fact that we in the East, uh, we, we, we have, uh, or we need to have actually, a deeper knowledge of the Western theology, which, uh, which still remains a huge challenge 
Well, sometimes uh, either we ignore it or consciously we neglect it. And this behavior, I think it's also similar on the other side of the river. So I think, if I may say so, that the ecumenical movement, what tried to achieve was to, to bring, to build bridges, bridges of communication and of unity. But we forget, we forget uh, constantly that the two banks of the river are not identical. So from the one side of the river, from the one bank, you can have forests, or you can have hills. And from the other side of the, of, of the river, you can have desert, you can have uh, volcanoes or what, uh, different stuff. But the most important is that these two different places are into now a status of communication and we can exchange our uh, talents, our charisma and our service in order to achieve this unity in the name and in the shake of unity in order to, to service uh, uh, the society and the humanity as a whole. So also, let me, Father Cyril, uh, Geoffrey Mukadizi, a student of our program, says, so many Orthodox leaders I have had saying ecumenism is not Orthodox. Is it because of WCC or how do you take? Um, and there's also another one, would you like to, to, to give it now or one yeah, by one? I will answer probably this one. Well, okay. uh, well, the ecumenical movement is not, is not ideal. Uh, and it had many pitfalls, had many shortcomings and mistakes in the past. And also it was mis misunderstood uh, to a great extent by, by many in the Orthodox uh, world. So it's just like any, any life uh, process of peace building, of reconciliation that occurred in, you know, in the human history, uh, which has a lot of misunderstandings on both sides. Uh, I would not say that, again, that the WCC was an ideal partner for the Orthodox churches. That's why, um, uh, well, initiatives like the special participation of the Orthodox churches and the ecumenical movement was needed uh, in order to kind of amend the procedures and the protocols of, of the Orthodox participation in the ecumenical movement. Or, yeah, after the, you mean after the Campera, right? Exactly. You mean after the Campera Assembly, 1991, right. Right. Yeah, the Special Commission of Participation. Exactly, yeah. and the meeting with Thessaloniki uh, that followed yeah. up. Uh, also, the Orthodox are not ideal partners for the WCC. We are very difficult. <laughs> uh, we are probably the most difficult partners for the WCC. And still, the w WCC bears with us, and we bear with them. <laughs> so it's not uh, it's not an ideal partnership. No way on both sides. And we, we just need to be tolerant to each other. We need to you know to bear with one another, uh, and uh, we need to properly to criticize one another from time to time. It's helpful. Um, uh, but also, but also, if I may, to be sincere, you said that to have a basis of sincere dialogue. Huh? I mean, to to base our dialogue on sincerity, and also um, that's why uh, in the beginning of the dialogue between the official, I mean, dialogue between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, the dialogue was characterized as a dialogue of charity. Uh, in order to break the ice in the first uh, during the first years, and then we passed on to the second uh, phase of the dialogue of of, uh, of the truth. But uh, I mean, we have always to keep this balance between the dialogue of truth and the dialogue of charity of, of love. Otherwise, uh, you're going to be lost. And I think yeah. I believe that the, the schism between the East and the West, the Catholic and the Orthodox Church, happened primarily because of the lack of trust. Uh, mm -hmm. It was not so much because of the theological issues, because the theological issues always existed. Yes. <clears throat> they did not impede very much us, you know, from being, from staying together. Uh, what, what happened, what I believe what was the milestone uh, in, the, in the relationship, in the, in the, in the kind of uh, breakup that we had was the fourth, uh, fourth Crusade, when the Latins uh, conquered Constantinople and really damaged the, the trust that the Orthodox had to the West. And of course, we should remember that the Westerners also were cheated by, you know, by the Byzantines at the time, and they lost yeah. their trust in the Byzantines uh, with uh, the communists, uh, the Alexis's kind of policies of cheating, you know, the, the Latins. So it was a mutual mistrust that led to, uh, to the schism. And I believe that nowadays, the most important thing even more important than the theological dialogue, which is still important, of course, uh, discussing theological issues, is to rebuild trust 
And to be to rebuild trust, we need to be sincere with one another. And primarily, we need to be sincere with ourselves. We need to, to know ourselves, what we believe and what we want from the ecumenical dialogue. Yes, sure, sure. So we have another question uh, coming again from Geoffrey. He says, the, the fall of Byzantine Empire exposed badly the East. Are we having challenges with our mode of solving crisis in our church with our patriarchs today? Hmm. Uh, yes, we do have, and we always have. Uh, I, I don't recall any single moment any single minute in the church history which did not have troubles, you know, problems with the patriarchates, with, you know, with the authorities, with the theologians. Uh, it was, well, the entire church history is a constant flood or a stream of problems, of issues. And it did not stop nowadays. I would say that if we study the past of the church, um, uh, if we scrutinize the history of the church, we find uh, the past of the church much more outrageous than its present. That's why I say sometimes that the past of the church is really um, a kind of uh, uh, a refreshment for for our our time. Because when we see look in the past, we find there are much more problems than we have today, uh, and uh, uh, that's why yes, there are problems, but we should not be. Uh, afraid of just, just afraid of those problems. We should not be frightened by those problems. Just just like with the WCC or our other ecumenical initiatives. Yes, those partners are difficult, as we are difficult partners. But it should not frighten us. It should not you know prevent us from uh, engaging with one another. That's why the problems of our church should not prevent us from engaging with our own church nowadays. We should just be you know good Christians. And those problems actually, I believe that those pro problems are providential because they. Uh, urge us to get mature, that, that they allow us to grow up as Christians, not to be babies, because it's yes. kind of a ch childish attitude. Well, there is a problem with the church, I will leave it. No, it's a very childish attitude. If we are grown ups, we uh, face those problems, you know, boldly and uh, with uh, courage. Mm -hmm. so, something else also that I would like to say uh, in relation to what you said just before about the tradition, do you remember the, the term of tradition uh, regarding the ecumenical movement? Uh, I, just it came to my mind that during the 50s and 60s, we have this, uh, by that time, it was young, let's say, young uh, generation of theologians of Western Europe, like uh, Karl Barth and uh, uh, Ratzinger, uh, Kung and uh, De, De Lulac and so on and so forth. So we have at the same time in the Protestant world and the Catholic Church, and in the Orthodox also uh, world, uh, we, we have some kind of a shift, some kind of, 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 uh, of a movement going back. So the slogan from the, coming from the Protestant side, it was uh, go back to the Bible. Right. For, from, for, for the Catholics, it was let's, let's go back to the post, uh, to the pre Trinidine period. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to the apostolic ages. Let's find uh, the, our common roots back to the one tradition with capital T. And, and, I, also, and, I think there was a, in the Catholic Church, it was coming back to Thomas Aquinas. No, no, it was uh, beyond him, beyond him. And at the same time, also, the, the John uh, Florovsky and other um, very pro, um, dominant uh, theological yeah, but, figures by that time, from the Orthodox side, side you have this. Um, this is slogan, uh, go back to the fathers. So we have uh, this uh, movement from the whole Christianity, Protestant Catholicism and Orthodoxy going back in order to find their common historical root. And so you see that the ecumenical movement it, in its first step was based on tradition with the true meaning of the term tradition with capital T. So the ecumenical movement was based on tradition, on, on traditionists, but not on traditionalists, those yeah. who are identical with the fundamentalists and with the conservatives. So you see that the, the, the same notion of tradition was used in a different way, in a different way. Also, um, we have another uh, question from the Vocati President. Uh, may, may it comment? says, uh, how successful and... 
Yeah, yes, 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 please. I completely agree. And I think uh, there are different interpretations of uh, this slogan, Florovsky's slogan, uh, go back to the fathers. Um, uh, some people really want to go back to the past. Uh, and instead, I think to go back to the fathers means to go back to the revelation that they had received. It, it means go, going up. Uh, that is kind of the alternative to traditionalism, go, going up. I would even rephrase this phrase, going back to the fa fathers. I would say, going forward to the fathers. The fathers are not behind us. They are in front of us. We need to go forward to them, not back to them. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, so we have another question from the... Um, did I, did I say that? Uh, from, coming from the Vocati president? No, I think not. So how successful and for how long the multinational character of the Byzantine or Christian Roman Empire was? Yeah. Did I mention that question before no, or not? No, no, no. No, no. So I, I repeat it. Uh, so how successful and for how long the multinational character of the Byzantine or Christian Roman Empire was? Well, certainly the Byzantine, well, there was no such a thing as a Byzantine Empire, as we know. It's a very modern construct. There was the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, it had this idea of being universal, of being, uh, of covering, potentially covering the entire world. And I think in this point, it cohered with the idea of the church, with the self-perception of the church. The church also wanted to cover the entire world, and they kind of concurred. In, in this uh, ecumenical uh, universal vision. Uh, well, I believe that the Byzant well, the Roman Empire, called it the Roman Empire, um, uh, was really universal. It was really uh, inclusive uh, in most kind of periods of time. There were different periods, of course, as, as, as in any state. Uh, th there were tendencies of, you know, self uh, kind of containment, self-sufficiency, autarkia, uh, in the empire, there were also tendencies, you know, to exclude, to to fight, to protect the front frontiers. But essentially, I remember very well the lessons which uh, Professor Vlasius Fidas gave us in, at the University of Athens. That the Roman Empire, the Byzantium, always wanted to expand. There were no frontier. There were no borders in the in that empire. There were only frontiers, and they tended to expand as as wide as possible. I think that was the ideal of the empire. It was not always mad. Was not, did not happen all the time, but it was as a, a, an ideal. And that's why I think this ideal sustained uh, the Roman Empire uh, to be the longest living empire in the human history, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a popular idea going back to Gibbon that with the reception, with the adoption of Christianity, the Roman Empire started to decline. I think it was a completely wrong uh, uh, concept because with the uh, reception of Christianity, the Roman Empire reborn uh, uh, itself. It re kind of resurrected, as it were, and it lasted longer than any other empire in the human history. Yes, correctly. Also, if I may also make another input to what you have said till now, Father Cyril, so much interesting and important is that also we have to... to, to oh. Oh, also, we have a uh, emeritus professor with us, uh, Mr. Vasiliadis. Can you listen to us? No, no. Oh. I cannot hear him. No. no, me neither. No, I lost him. Anyway, um, so I was trying to say that uh, also I think the ecumenical movement has shown the the the, the anthropological side, the anthropological side of of of. Uh, the schism of the separation and of all this uh, division. And uh, also we, I have the personal feeling that sometimes we as Christians coming from different uh, conventions and traditions, and I have the feeling that we argue to each other about something, about the ownership of something which is not ours. Yeah. I mean, we argue about Christ's body, which is not ours. It's right. Christ's body. Right. That's a very good so, so we have to realize that, and we have to be, you know, as more uh, um, concrete. But at the same time, I have the feeling that we try to dehumanize God and to 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 present Him according to to our perception that we keep in our mind, which yeah, most of the times. 
we do not. we do that in a in a not successful way. That's true. Because yeah. our mind, the way that we think, the way that we worship, it has to do also with the local community where we were grew up, where we were uh, cult, um, uh, um, received our education, and so on and so forth. So it's it's. I don't know what to, do, to, yeah. to say. I mean. There are different uh, different um, levels, I would say, of appropriation of God. And there is always this dangerous tendency to appropriate God, to, to make God our own, our property. Uh, we can appropriate yes. God to a nation, like a nation contains God, like the Greek nation or Serbian or Russian nation uh, is the holder yes. Yes. Of, you know, of God. We try to confine God mm -hmm. to... You know, to the clerical ranks. Literally, we try to put God to the pocket of our cassock, like here, and to keep him, him here, to keep him here. Or we try to, you know, appropriate God for, I would say, even for a confession. It is the same tendency to appropriate God. And uh, I can, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's also a wrong way of appropriating God. Uh, it is our task is to be appropriated by God, not to appropriate God. Yes, exactly. So um, let me check the messages. Uh, I think we have, as far as I can tell, I see no any new messages. I mean, new questions addressed to you, my father, Cyril. Uh, oh, wait. Um, yes. Okay, we have Jeff Jeffrey again. He's very talkative, and I like it. <laughs> so he says, "Is there anything we can copy from West Church to make us strong? Not the way situation is. Second, for instance, Second Vatican transformed West Church." Well, I don't think we need to. We need to make. Would the you West like me to read it again? I, I I think I get it. Yeah. I think we do not need to copy okay, any okay. or anything, and we do not need to force our, our partners, ecumenical partners, to copy ourselves. Uh, they do not need to copy mm -hmm. us, as we do not need to copy them. Uh, the thing is to uh, find a rapprochement, to find a convergence uh, in a different mm -hmm. way, not by, by copying, but, but by discovering. Uh, our own resources, I believe. Uh, in our tradition, we have everything that we need for, for, you know, for the ecumenical reconciliation eventually. To be one church, we have everything, all the sources that we need in our past, in our tradition, uh, in our churches. Uh, we don't need to invent new things. We just need to, you know, to discover our, uh, ourselves. And I believe even the Catholic Church uh, also uh, looks thoroughly uh, into its own tradition, and it does. It tries, really struggles to uh, to find resources for for ecumenism in its own tradition. It's quite successful in that. Then we can really uh, get closer to each other, and that is the basis of our current dialogue. That is the reason of. Uh, I just want to remind um, uh, to say uh, that we, for instance, there is a group of Saint Renius. It's an ecumenical Orthodox Catholic group that worked for uh, over ten years. Uh, to uh, draft a common uh, document on, on primacy in the church. Uh, and the primacy uh, in synodality. It is, it's called, exactly, it's called the Serbic Communion. Uh, and it, it, it explores the um, uh, forms of primacy and synodality in the past of the church. And we mm -hmm. discovered in our own past, uh, you know, the, all the elements to bring us closer to each other. We don't need to copy each other for that. Mm -hmm. Probably we need to reread history. And we do to, to, to read it history and probably to exchange our resources, our sources, I mean, our sources, okay. historical sources, because okay. each site has its own sources and it's based on its own sources. So we have to exchange probably our so to, to see what the other have so as, a, as, as a base okay. of dialogue that's and communication. Of our dialogue, that's what we are trying to do. We do it mm -hmm. in the official dialogue, Orthodox Catholic dialogue. We do it in the official, in unofficial dialogues as well. We study mm -hmm. history and we discover our common common goal. Quite successful, I would say. Right. Um, so... Um, there is no other question, ah, now I hear your voice, Mr. Vasiliadis. I can see you, but I can... Hear you. 
If you hear me. Yes. Ah, now. Okay. It was like a voice coming from the sky, but now it's... Uh, Father Cyril was uh, uh, quite uh, a promising uh, for us. Uh, lecturer, because we have just received a positive answer from uh, Palgrave uh, Macmillan uh, Publishing House. They accepted our offer to uh, publish uh, uh, the book on deaconesses. Oh. So this is a good uh, sign, I mean, a good signal we have just received during Father Series lecture. Oh, that's wonderful. That's <laughs> like yes. wonderful I, news. I was uh, not uh, uh, listening to a part of it, so I don't know whether you have uh, responded to uh, my question about a comparison of the ecumenism in Byzantium and the modern era autocephalism that has been developed uh, either causing or uh, solving uh, um, new situations, new problems. Can you comment on this, Father Cyril, before we yeah. close? Well, I would say that uh, there is a difference between the Byzantine uh, and modern ecumenisms also. Well, I, I, stre uh, I stressed, underline the commonalities, but also there are differences and we should be uh, honest about them. Uh, the most important difference, I believe, was that uh, Byzantine ecumenism was coercive. It was not just, you know, uh, people were invited to the same table, and if they, they disagreed, they were left, you know, to go and to do whatever they wanted. No, they were forced to be together. Uh, even Justinian, who was, you know, who promoted uh, the unity through dialogue, after they could not agree on dialogue, they, he just, you know, cleansed them up, and he uh, forbade them and exiled them, and people like Severus of Antioch, he was exiled and so forth. Uh, so Byzantium was a, uh, so, well, it, it continued the, the line, the traditions of the Roman Empire. Modern ecumenism is not coercive. No one forces the churches, you know, to be together. Uh, well, probably that is the problem of modern ecumenical movement because the Orthodox churches do not want to participate. And no one, there is no, no there is no an empire which would force them to participate in the ecumenical movement. Uh, but I believe that it is, that is the right way, you know, to be uh, to to do ecumenism by consent, by agreeing to or agreeing or disagreeing, to be ecumenical, to uh, to do ecumenism. Uh, that that I would say is the most uh, kind of important difference, and that has to do also with uh, another kind of part of your question about autocephalism. That's exactly because our churches, autocephalous churches, they are not forced to. They cannot be forced to, to do something together. They cannot even come together to the pan Council, you know, uh, because there is no an empire which would force them. The problem is there are too many empires <laughs> that kind of underpin their, uh, their policies. And that's why they cannot come together. So, yes, uh, uh, to be free requires uh, responsibility. The churches in order to enjoy their freedom and the right to be, to, you know, to act in consent, by consent, they also have to be responsible for what they're doing. Uh, and it's, it's not always the case that freedom comes together in one package with responsibility. Um, yes, what, what can we do about this? I don't know, honestly. It's really a headache for the ecumenical patriarch. I'm, I'm not I'm not, you know, envy, envious about what he's doing, about his his role. His role is really tremendously difficult to uh, to bring churches together. Sometimes it's, it's you know, I'm joking, and it's it's like herding cats, you know, uh, and uh, and uh, putting them together. It's almost impossible. Uh, the same is with the modern autocephalous churches. It's almost impossible to uh, bring them together, to do together, to act together, even in the ecumenical enterprises. But yes, I think we need to appreciate the role of the ecumenical patriarchate, uh, this very ungrateful, very difficult role that he, uh, this patriarchate plays. And uh, yeah, we just need to carry on. Thank you very much, uh, Father Cyril. Uh, Professor uh, Vasilianis, would you like to, to add something else or? No, no, just to remind Father Cyril that uh, encouraged by the new development uh, 
uh, with the book of Deaconesses, I would like to ask all the speakers not forget uh, not forget the, to send uh, to send us uh, um, a copy or an extended copy or whatever of their lecture to see how we can um, do with this because we have so far uh, selected uh, four and expecting for the series five to see how we can uh, deal with this uh, not only for the students, for the sake of the students, but also for the wider, since these public lectures uh, are addressed uh, to a wider uh, um, uh, readership. No. The floor is yours now, Father, uh, for the closing. Yes, I think I see that we have, I, we, we have not, there's not any new uh, question for Father Cyril. Uh, I think um, it was a very, very interesting uh, presentation, Father Cyril. We thank you. We thank you indeed. And uh, uh, also, um, as all things, um, I, I would say, start and end with a story, and uh, mainly all wise things come through uh, doing a dialogue. I would like, I would like to to end with uh, a story from your experience regarding the ecumenical dialogue. I would like to end with a, a short story from your personal experience vis-a-vis -vis the ecumenical uh, movement, something yes, that you would like well, to share with us. Uh, yeah, well, there are too many stories to pick up one of them, <laughs> I would say. Yes. Uh, uh, what I believe really happens and what is the good the, the, probably the best outcome of any ecumenical dialogue uh, from my experience of dialogues is that in the ecumenical dialogues we learn much more about ourselves than we learn about mm -hmm. others uh, that's how I discovered a lot of things in our in my own tradition I, I should I should confess and um, I believe that is the most important thing that's why only for that reason we need to be uh, engage in the dialogue. Uh, we don't need to be, you know, to expect others to convert to our faith. Don't let others to expect that we would convert to, to their faith. Yes, of course. Uh, but what we really uh, uh, are benefiting uh, from the dialogue is that we learn about, uh, about ourselves. And only for that reason, it's uh, um, uh, we, we have to be engaged. That would be my kind of conclusion. Uh, bottom up. What about what about the local ecumenism? I mean, I have a feeling that in your country there is uh, some signs. We don't know we are from uh, outside. I would, say, I would say in Ukraine the ecumenical uh, dialogue is uh, really thriving. It's really alive and you know alive and kicking. It's uh, very rich and. Uh, there are many ecumenical encounters because, well, Ukraine is very diverse. Uh, yes, there is a, a kind of an autocephalous church now in Ukraine, but there are all, there are other churches, and you know there is a strong Greek Catholic church here, a, a Roman Catholic church, uh, many Protestant churches, um, a Muslim community, very strong Muslim community. Ukraine is a traditional Jewish country also. Well, in the you know, in the first Ukrainian Republic, Yiddish, the Jewish language, was one of the official languages in Ukraine. So all those uh, dialogues are, are very important in Ukraine. I, I would say it's kind of one of the most uh, ecumenically active countries in Eastern Europe. It's certainly more active ecumenically than Russia. Right. And uh, could I also pose a, uh, a personal question f from my side to, to, to you, Father, and that would be the, the last, if, if, if you wish. Yes. Are you in favor of, uh, I mean, is it better to have a bent unity instead of a broken unity? Could we bend our relation with a different one instead of having a broken? And if if that can take place, this this scheme of, of unification could take place. Uh, wh what would be the the, yeah. the, the benefit say, or the taking from the history? There were attempts uh, to uh, you know to enforce unity, to bring unity by force, and uh, they didn't last. 
for a long time. Mm. If you take, for instance, Constantius, uh, Constantius's policies or the policies of, uh, again, of Zeno, they did work uh, for a long time. You, you can achieve a moment of unity by force or, you know, by, uh, by ignoring or, you know, silencing theological issues. Uh, but that unity cannot last. You can have a lasting unity only when you solve the, sort, sort out theological problems, when you uh, uh, have this unity by consent uh, of the united parts. And uh, that's all, all the instruments that modern modernity offers us. We, we now take as a norm that uh, in order to be engaged in a dialogue, you need to, to be free. You need to, you know, to be free to disagree something that uh, yeah. hardly was acceptable you know in the in the time of byzantium no the people were not free to you know to reject or you mm -hmm. know uh, to disagree often uh, that's why it's a great benefit of our time that it teaches us to be free to, to act by consent and that i think that is a basis of, of, of a lasting unity those who were opponents to the, the, the church's decisions or of the emperor's decisions uh, were actually uh, enemies of the empire. So there was no possibility to have a different uh, opinion within the synodical system. Well, sometimes, that... it worked. sometimes it worked, but yeah. often it didn't work. And that's why we have so lasting schisms that outlive the empire. Okay. The, the empire died, but the schism caused by the coercion, you know, by uh, such policies, they, they continue. Okay, so also we have a, a question coming from Professor Dimitrios Keramidas. Uh, he says, thank you for your lecture, Father Cyril. My question regards the petition of non-Byzantine churches in global communion. For instance, what do they bring with their known synodal uh, structures, probably it's in this. Yeah, if you if you mean the Oriental churches and the Church of the East, probably uh, yes, the uh, Greek or the well, Greek Catholic. Well, similar in, in in fact, and actually, I should say that uh, what we need to appreciate in those churches that they are not non-imperial churches. They don't have this kind of uh, legacy of uh, of empire very much. Of course, they were connected with their own empires. If you take the Ethiopian Church, it was you know for forever connected with the Ethiopian Empire. Um, but what we have to appreciate in those churches is their non-imperial experience, experience of relying on themselves, on their own people, on their own communities. And I think this is a very valuable uh, thing. And they also have treasured a lot of legacies uh, that we've forgotten. Uh, um, and um, we should just ap appreciate those legacies. Uh, of course, we have to continue discussing theological issues that there are, well, even though after the agreements or agreement of Shambhazi in 1919 and before that Anbabisho agreement in 1989, we agreed that uh, there are no theological differences between us because we've adopted this Neo-Calcedonian language. Yes, exactly. By, by Justinian and, uh, and, uh, and the people. So there are no theological differences so much as there are cultural differences, differences mm -hmm. of identities. And I believe the, the most important impediment for the unity, reunification with the Oriental churches is the identity policies. People yes. you know, uh, cherish their identities. They, they want to be what they, they were for centuries. Yes, yes, exactly. Their position to others. Like for us, uh, we were taught, I mean, for generations, for centuries, that yes, all exactly. those Armenians, you know, and Copts, they are like, you know, devils. I recently <laughs> read, you know, the writings of uh, Cyril Lucaris, Kyrillos Luka, uh, Lucaris. Lucaris. He was very ecumenical, as we know. Yeah, he mm -hmm. was very uh, open to the open West, but yes. he really hated cults. He really believed that they are like you know, demons, you know. And this is kind of very much in our culture court, and this is very wrong, as they uh, were taught for generations to hate Chalcedon, and they believe that Chalcedon is kind of a diabolic uh, device. And mm -hmm. this, uh, this is not, you know, this cannot be sustained by theology, by history. It's just cultural, and I and the thing uh, pertinent. Right? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. The collegial uh, identity—it's—it's it's very important in the in the process and in the history of of, uh, of religions. All right. So I see no further any any further questions, Father Cyril. With uh, with this, I think we should uh, end uh, our today's uh, public uh, lecture once more. We thank you very much. I for thank your... you both. 
<laughs> okay. Thank you, Father Augustinos, also for, yeah. for your moderation. It was wonderful, mm. wonderful dialogue that we had. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, and uh, thank you all of you for watching, for your comments, for your questions addressed to Father Cyril, and also we thank also the, the, the institution, the Moat Institution, which gave actually this opportunity to, to be together, even though in such a... Because actually of the pandemic situation, now we can be broadcasting, otherwise uh, it was in a narrow... Uh, level now it's more it's a wider level <laughs> okay it's more ecumenical now <laughs> okay so thank you uh, father cyril and uh, okay. bye 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 all the best